speaking today with Bob James. Welcome to the program. Thanks an awful lot. It's a real pleasure to be part of the DCHA Gold Standard Program. Bob, tell me a little bit about what you're currently doing and your role and affiliation. Okay, I'm a faculty member in the Dairy Science Department at Virginia Tech. I actually have a three-way appointment. I do some teaching. My research is one of the major areas is in calf nutrition research, calf management research, and a lot of that is field conditions. We've done some work on farms in California, Virginia, North Carolina. I've had a chance to apply both under our research farm as well as on farms of various sizes across the country. We're talking today specifically about some of the things you've learned about preventing calf scours. Frame for me, if you would, the challenge of scours for the calf in its lifetime. Well, I think one of the first things I want to emphasize, and that's really defining scours, and what we're talking about here is is diarrhea that's really close to the consistency of water. And I realize that these calves are, are very, very prone to digestive upsets, and it's something that's relatively common. And, and I also realize that a real well-formed stool is not normal in young calves. They're going to be a little certain amount of looseness, but we're really concerned about when dehydration becomes a problem and calves start losing electrolytes, become depressed. There's where that becomes a problem. The real challenge we have with diarrhea is we're really not sure what the cause is. It could be bacterial, it could be viral, so we really have to address the clinical symptom of the disease. Today I wanted to talk about the the timeline of what you can do to help prevent scours. And let's first start prior to calving. What can be done even at that period of time to help prevent scours? I think it really begins with the dry cow, and we want that cow in good condition when she dries off because it's very difficult to do anything with body condition during the dry periods. We want a good diet, so the first of all, that she'll respond well to a vaccination program and that the calf that's going to be born will be born with a good condition as well so that it can respond to a vaccination program. And and I would emphasize there that this is something that each farm has got to work out with their veterinarian as to what the challenges are that they face. Dry cow nutrition is not as quantitatively important, but qualitatively it is. I find on a lot of farms we see some slips in mineral and particularly vitamin nutrition around this time of the year because most of the stored feeds, the vitamin content is largely gone and we have to rely on supplementation. And and I like to make sure that that's force-fed in some type of a concentrate mix or TMR and that we don't really rely on free choice minerals or, or vitamins for these animals. The other priority that we have, and I think that's really starting out with a clean calving environment. We have to remember that this calf is sterile at birth. Visualize it's kind of a race between the bacteria in the environment, the colonization of that calf, and the colostrum that's going to get down there later on in the life. So we really have to focus at each stage along the way of calving and colostrum collection that we maintain a really high level of sanitation. We want to make sure that, first of all, that when we milk the fresh cow, that we've got good, clean milking equipment. If they're not going through the normal parlor, that we really make the effort to clean and sanitize storage containers. And then either feed this colostrum very quickly or that it's cooled down so we minimize the bacterial growth. Because we found that these bacteria, the calves will try and absorb bacteria almost as readily as the antibodies will. And the bacteria gets there first, we can really have some problems with some antibody absorption from the colostrum. How important is colostrum management in mitigating the incidence of scours later in life? Well, you know, it's really everything. And I think the important thing to remember is you really don't get a second chance to fix anything that might have gone wrong the first time. You only get one chance. So we're talking about clean colostrum. The DCHA, the gold standards, really have set a standard of less than 100,000. And I think that means periodically we run some uh, bacterial tests on the colostrum. We've seen colostrum in the field as high as several million. And in those situations, the antibody absorption is really pretty low. So that's one of the first targets that we might look at. The other one is measuring the antibody content. And we can do that in two different ways. One of them might be using the colostrometer, which I think a lot of folks are familiar with. It's relatively simple to uh, test colostrum at room temperature. And we'd like that to be at least 50 grams per liter. 
Another newer method that's been introduced is using a refractometer. And anytime we have a value above 22 on the BRICS refractometer, that can tell us that we've got some high antibody content colostrum. The classical recommendation, and almost every dairy producer knows it, the three Qs. We want to feed the quantity of four quarts. We want to feed it the high quality, which is the 50 grams per liter. And we want to feed it quickly, which is hopefully within the first two hours of life of that calf. And I'd also like to throw in a C, and that's for the cleanliness of that colostrum. Now, I think we really have to find out how we're doing, and that's evaluating it. And there are two ways to evaluate the success of our colostrum program. When I go on a farm and I see they've got a lot of health problems with either scours or sometimes respiratory, I really want to say, well, how good are we doing on colostrum? And that's measuring bovine's total serum proteins. And our target there is we'd like to see probably 85 to 90 percent of those calves over 5.2 grams per deciliter. It's not a perfect measure, but on a farm, it's going to give us a real good barometer of our colostrum program. If possible, it's even better to measure serum IgGs or the antibodies, and our goal there is 10 grams per liter. Sometimes you'll see that written down as 10 milligrams per milliliter, and that's the same thing quantitatively. On a lot of farms, there may be a problem with not having adequate colostrum, and in that case, there are some really excellent colostrum replacers out there that are either serum-based or based on some freeze-dried colostrum. Those products ought to have at least 100 grams per dose at the bare minimum, and you really need to be very careful in mixing them that the water temperature is somewhere between 110 and 120 degrees Fahrenheit, not too hot, not too cold so that it goes into solution well and that we don't do anything negative to these colostrum replacers. But those things are really essential to getting a good handle on controlling scours on the farm. What is the biggest challenge you see on dairies today with colostrum management? I think one of the biggest challenges, everyone knows what to do, but there's such a disconnect between the individual or the person uh, or the location where cows calve when and how the fresh cow is milked, and then how that colostrum is handled by the people in the milking parlor, and then who winds up feeding the calves. Often the poor person feeding the calves is blamed for the incidence of calf scours, when it might be the cow freshened in a less than desirable environment, the colostrum sat on the floor of the parlor for several hours before it was cooled, never tested, and the calf was maybe a little bit too old by the time it was fed colostrum. So I think we really need to think about that as as a system and assign some protocols to where we're sure that these very simple but important things are carried out. Even if a producer does well in dry cow and colostrum management, what is critical in feeding and housing wet calves to prevent scours? Well, I think some things have really changed there. We used to have the philosophy of limit feeding these calves with about a pound of powder or a gallon a day so that we could get them weaned early. And I think that's really changed as an industry because we realize that calves require a lot of nutrition to maintain their immune system, about 30% of their nutrition at times to respond to an immune challenge. The other thing is that with limit feeding, sometimes that's just barely enough to keep that calf at maintenance conditions and really doesn't provide for much with growth. So we're seeing, we used to call it accelerated feeding, and I'd I'd like to call it more biologically normal, where we're providing the nutrients that a calf would probably see if it was nursing its dam. So we're increasing the level of protein, we're increasing the level of fat in there. Although the fat is still probably a little bit controversial, I think it provides us with maybe some risk management. So now we're looking at rather than a pound of milk solids, at least one and a half and probably as high as two and a half pounds of solids. We're seeing more use of three-quart bottles. And so if a calf is challenged, they've got enough body reserves, I think, to respond to uh, uh, infectious challenge a whole lot more successfully. The other part of that, again, that I keep harping on, and and that is the sanitation, that this calf feeding equipment is as clean as we are in the milking parlor. If we're feeding pasteurized waste milk, that we have low bacteria count, less than 20,000 colony forming units per ml. This is the same standard as for human. You know, we found that on well-managed pasteurizers, they really are very successful in achieving that. I think one of our causes, and we'll hear it maybe of nutritional scours and where calves get some digestive upset, it may not be infectious, but it might predispose them to some infectious diarrhea 
and that's consistency, being very consistent. And if we're feeding milk replacers, that we maintain the same mixing rate. In my experience, it's great if we weigh out that powder and we weigh out the water so that we get the solids level that we want to achieve somewhere between 12.5% and 17% solids, and that it's the same day after day after day. This, I think, really helps that calf maintain a healthy digestive system. That, to me, is really very important. We do have some medications that are that I think are very useful. Some of the coccidia stats have been, I think, very successfully incorporated. And even some products for fly control, I think, have been incorporated that can really help us out a good bit. Then we follow that all up with something that is what I call a little thing that is a big thing, and that's free choice water and fresh, clean water for that calf every day because it really helps to facilitate a starter grain, which we like to see before that calf by day three. And that's, again, one of the gold standards for the DCHA program. So we have that calf um, at a pretty high plane of nutrition and realize, especially in those first couple of days, that this is really just critical. And the last part is housing. I think clean, dry, good air quality, good ventilation system, size so that this calf can turn around. And particularly in the warmer climates that we have some deep bedding in cold conditions. And it's interesting to note that for young calves less than three weeks old, cold stress is less than 59 degrees Fahrenheit. So even in some of our, what we would think is warmer climates in California or high desert where it's warm during the day, these calves can get cold stressed at night. And that's an important consideration. In the more northern climate, these calf jackets have been really successful in helping that calf retain body heat and lower their maintenance requirements. You'll notice that in cold conditions with a gallon of milk a day, we're not even providing enough nutrients for that calf to maintain their body weight, let alone grow. And I think that's where we've seen some real big benefits for growth, for health, for controlling scours, in more liberal feeding of calves. Lastly, we've seen some things on the group housing with these auto feeders. I know initially I was rather skeptical but some of the computerized auto feeders. When you think about it, and that calf under a conventional situation of being fed at five o'clock in the afternoon and not again until the next morning, that's a long period of time for a young animal to go with that feed. We've seen the auto feeders, I think particularly in the east and some of the smaller herds have used those. This more mimics mother nature nature with the calf being able to consume smaller meals more frequently. I think we're, we're kind of modeling what's happening with the dam. The other one, maybe not quite as uh, controllable, and these are some of the mob feeders, and I think they work better maybe in pasture scenarios or in areas where calving is a little bit more concentrated at a time during the year. And then, of course, the last thing we have are really controlling some vectors that can spread disease, and that means dogs, cats, birds, rodents, exposure to calves, and really with people, we realize that having gloves and feeding sick calves last is part of that biosecurity arrangement that can really help us to keep calf scours under control. Thanks for discussing these scour prevention strategies. Appreciate your time today.